Hello, everyone, and welcome to NAGA. Today, we'd like to welcome Romit Day, who's a partner at PwC, to share with us some perspectives from the annual PwC study with leaders. Romit, welcome to Nugget. Thank you. Thanks, Jazz. Thanks for having me on. It's uh, always a delight to have a conversation with you, and I'm really excited about um, in Nugget, which is the Netrio event. It's awesome to be here. Thank you, Romit. Can you tell us a little bit more about this study? It looks like it's the 24th one, so PwC has been conducting it for a while. What type of questions um, does it cover? Yeah, so uh, for, for the sake of this conversation, I thought it'd be interesting to actually get a few extracts from our annual survey. As you noted, uh, the CEO survey has been run by PwC for the last 24 years. Um, so it's a longstanding survey. It's a global survey. Um, it's cross industry, cross vertical, and it covers companies um, primarily um, in the Fortune 500 and then a little bit uh, smaller than that as well. Uh, we also do a CFO pulse survey and a CIO CTO survey. And rather than restricting uh, this conversation to just the CEO um, survey, I thought it'd be interesting to actually get an intersection and see how uh, the feedback is or what the outlook is for CFOs and CIO CTOs as well. So that's sort of what I've put together for uh, this, this session. Um, and I'm excited to get into it with you. Super, let's get started. All right, well, so, First things first, um, what is the CFO's confidence level? Um, you know, this is something that is such an indicator. It's a barometer of uh, how the economy is doing. It covers um, the confidence levels for CEOs across industries, across verticals. And it's the question that was asked was, how confident are you about your organization's prospects for growth in the next 12 months to, um, to three years? And then we are also basically looking at a slice of data, which is only the confident or the very confident ones. And two things struck me as I was looking at this. Number one, clearly there's a very positive outlook. I mean, there's been discussion around the so-called roaring 20s being emulated uh, post-pandemic, i.e. after the Spanish flu. Um, and the other is that, you know, in addition to that sort of general uh, positive outlook, there's also the second aspect of comparative uh, positiveness i.e. if you look at 2009, which is uh, you know the financial crisis, um, the confidence levels are significantly high, higher than that coming out of the financial crisis 2010, we are almost at the same levels. And to me, that is really sort of uh, important to recognize because that sort of indicates uh, in some ways the strength of the economy and where it is. Um, so if we, if we drill down on this and say, okay, well, that's sort of the general confidence in the strength of the economy, what are CEOs thinking about? Um, then we look at some priorities and how um, spending is going to change or increase or decrease um, uh, over the next year. And you can see that um, the top three areas or priorities for CEOs include digital transformation, initiatives to realize cost efficiencies, cybersecurity and data security, data privacy. Um, and you can see that there's a pretty heavy focus on these three, along with leadership and talent development um, to actually help the organizations build back in some ways, um, to, to paraphrase President Biden's um, agenda, build back better. Um, you know, the what, what is also striking to me is that advertising and brand building is right at the bottom of this right so there's to me that is indicative of companies actually feeling strong about their presence in the market and their connection to their buyers or customers and consumers and they need to actually do things differently to actually fulfill the brand brand promise in many different ways so um maybe i'll pose a question back to you as ceo jasmine um you know what is your take um on this and does this reflect your priorities as ceo as well that's a great question. And the data does indeed resonate very strongly with us as well as we run the business and as we experience it from our customers. The first around digital transformation is certainly something we're hearing loud and clear with the onset of greater movement towards work from home. We're seeing mm -hmm. the need for everyone to really be able to consume their digital experiences in a higher 
quality, right? And that is in, indeed something that's driving that digital transformation in terms of improving their technology assets and the right. ability to monitor them. So from a service perspective, we're certainly sensing a lot of interest from our customers on being able to better have uh, greater visibility over their infrastructure network as well as applications. Yeah. They're also starting up new businesses. Many of our customers have been paying more attention to e-commerce as well as you know, their different ways in which they can um, interact and create new digital experiences with their customers, such as a, a medical client of ours that's actually creating digital concierge services, something they didn't used to have before. So that's mm -hmm. really inspiring a lot of digital transformation, not just in the way we work, on the way our customers work, but also in the businesses they're in. Um, right. The second major thing that we see here that is strong in our space is the focus on cybersecurity and data privacy. Mm -hmm. And given the um, number of you know, ransomware hacking incidences um, in the past year, um, that's certainly come to the forefront for our community as well. And that's only been a major area of investment for us as well as for our customers. So right. those are two areas that really stand out for us in terms of you know, resonating with what the other CEOs are expressing to you. Yep, yep. Well, it makes sense. And uh, I, you know, one point that struck me as I was studying some of this and reflecting on my conversations with uh, uh, some of our clients at the, at the C-suite level, you know, you see R&D and new product innovation, it's kind of low down there. Um, and I sort of probed on this with, um, you know, about a half a dozen companies, uh, very unscientific, just purely anecdotal. And what I realized is that the first one, which is digital transformation, actually contains a lot around innovation. So just as you were talking about mm -hmm. sort of uh, innovation through new business models, new offerings, um, you know, focusing on e-commerce and so on, there's a lot that we would probably think of as being um, basically um, business innovation, uh, which is actually packed into digital transformation. Um, and what they're, what they're excluding is sort of uh, pure product R&D, uh, new product introduction, which is actually sitting separately. So I think uh, we are aligned there. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to switch over a little bit and maybe offer some insights from a CFO's perspective. And this is where you know you see the contrast between the CEO's um, overall outlook and big picture considerations and a CFO's uh, perspective here. Um, and what's really interesting to me is this bit, which is sort of multiple parts to grow top line. Uh, it used to be that CFOs were focused really only on the bottom line to the exclusion of everything else. So I think that that's an interesting shift. Um, I think we started seeing that almost a decade ago with companies um, moving to SaaS and sort of going to the cloud in a big way. Um, CFOs um, actually sort of planning to uh, drive changes in products and services with 40, over 40% 40 looking to alter pricing and figure out new monetization strategies, new revenue models. I think that's pretty significant in itself because you know the fact that the CFOs are actually putting their weight behind um, business model innovation means that there's really new stuff that's going to come um, to market very, very quickly. Growth is driving um, uh, tech investments and this sort of business model innovation agenda is actually substantiated by CFOs saying, you know, I want to actually inject a certain amount of technology into my products and services. And we are certainly seeing that, you know, historically what we would see as um, sort of uh, uh, technology driven innovation really in the tech TMT vertical or tech media and telecommunications is something that we're seeing, seeing all across. And when I see something like that, I'm always reminded of uh, Mark Andreessen and his sort of statement, you know, software is eating the world. Everybody is in the software business, regardless of what industry they're in. Um, of course, the potential for the second or the third wave of COVID, that's a concern. Uh, remote work is important. And there's an interesting uh, sidebar, which I'll share in a minute. Um, you know, 54% of CFOs planning to make remote work a permanent option. And I'm sure you've um, instituted a similar remote working model. Uh, recently, PwC announced that uh, 40,000 of our employees are going to be given the option of uh, sticking to virtual work um, on an indefinite basis. They can continue to work from home as they like. Um, and then this whole notion of providing a safe working environment and 
meeting customer safety expectations is in there as well. Uh, now, here's the really interesting sidebar. If you keep that in mind, and now you see how CFOs are thinking, see, 84% of CFOs believe the company is successfully addressing employee mental health, and only 31% of employees actually agree. The very fact that mental health is now in focus uh, in the CFO's agenda, I think is very striking. And I think that it's time for companies to realize and really live out the promise that their most imp important asset is actually the employees. And the productivity of the assets, i.e. employee productivity, is in a large part influenced by mental health. And there, I think that we're gonna see some significant changes, investments and things like that happening in this area. Your thoughts on that? That makes a lot of sense. I, I think, you know, when we think of the previous slide and you talked about the major trends, we, it certainly resonates with us with respect to working from home. That is our business. I mean, that's also one reason why, you know, we've had so much traction recently because a lot of our customers are focusing a lot on transforming the way they work and needing to be able to connect, right, to uh, their customers and their company a lot better. So, there's certainly a lot of that. We're also noticing, for sure, the whole notion of the top line growth change. Um, you know, as a business, for example, we certainly are a subscription business, and we understand, you know, how CFOs are certainly looking at orchestrating the asset management and the financial um, elements of of being able to run the business, develop the R and D, but only right. be able to collect revenue over time. So there's a lot of different sort of ways of thinking about it, which it's not just a marketing exercise anymore, right? Pricing isn't not just a marketing exercise. It really is looking at the entire business model. And so that sort of rebooting, finessing is something that I know we're actively involved in and our customers are as well. In fact, we have a community of almost 1,100 software uh, providers and, and companies that actually manufacture applications. And many of them are looking at different ways in which they can understand their business models uh, better. Um, the notion that COVID is, is endemic, you know, as we look at, you know, what we do moving forward is mm -hmm. certainly something that we're focused on as well. Um, we are, as you observed, a, a remote first organization at this point. Um, right. Many of our customers have the same perspectives and we're also worried, right, about keeping our people safe. So that whole safe return thing is, is important and and to the next slide, with respect to the CFO's focus on mental health, a lot mm -hmm. of that is about talent management, that safe right. yep. um, You know, we find that as much as we've tried to come up with unlimited vacation days, Fridays, you know, like quiet Fridays and, mm -hmm. and social connections, we're finding that people want to connect with each other. We need to um, yep. you know, find ways in which we actually physically meet up where possible and yep. also just decompress on you know, for on weekends, for example, I've had to, you know, we're a global organization and I've had to put a little email footer saying, in spite of when I send this email, it doesn't mean that you should reply right away because everyone mm -hmm. has this pressure, right? To keep going um, if, when they see something in their inbox. So yeah, absolutely. Kind of change that mindset and establish the culture that wellness is, is critical. And that's something we've had to focus on as well. Yep, yep, I agree. And I think that in coming years, uh, employee engagement in a meaningful way is going to get transformed. Um, I'm already talking to a couple of companies that have defined a space which was new to me. Mm -hmm. um, they started talking about CLM and I said, oh, contract lifecycle management. And they said, no, career lifecycle management. Oh, I love and, it. Yeah. And, 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 and they're really beginning to think about what happens across the entire life cycle. Mm -hmm. right from start to finish and that's sort of the big picture context for a lot of changes in employee engagement along with the more tactical operational stuff that you were talking about which is like hey you know it's okay to take a break it's okay to stop working on the weekends it's okay to actually meet in person outside the office and so on so mm -hmm. that's awesome mm -hmm. um again i'm gonna in the interest of time switch to the cio cto perspective so now we have the third lens um, you know, and, you know, starting off with the changing work environment, what's top of mind for the CIO slash CTO? So you can see over 40% see data privacy, cybersecurity, and compliance as the most pressing challenges. You know, I'm sure that that's reflecting in your own numbers as well. Yeah. And what I found interesting, really fascinating was uh, this sort of almost 30% are saying, look, we don't necessarily have the right tools, the right platforms to actually support 
uh, hybrid working. Okay, and that's really striking to me. Um, you know, I was talking to somebody. Um, this is a contrast. I was talking to somebody who's actually associated with uh, Gov GovTech uh, Singapore, mm -hmm. and uh, you know how the how the country has actually been very successful, amongst the most successful in navigating the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is this is the CIO and responsible for some of the um, education uh, side of things. And he basically said, "Look, we already had." all the infrastructure in place, we just had to accelerate the activation, provisioning, rollout and adoption, which is very different from a lot of companies here, right? They're just saying, well, we, we were caught, uh, you know, unaware, we don't, we don't have the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And like you said, remote working comes with a lot more um, monitoring and management of devices um, as part of the game, uh, you know, it's no longer an optional thing. Um, and then the third one, you know, almost 50% um, rate, ranking data analytics is the most important capability. Uh, you know, there's a macro level trend here, which is that just processing transactions and getting um, transactions flowing through is not enough. Like that's not um, adequate to actually differentiate in the market. Yeah. Um, and so analytics provides the value add, the differentiation. And that's why I think that shows up. We'll drill down a little bit on this and you can actually get a different perspective here, um, you know, in terms of the total set of priorities and you can see data analytics to drive better decision-making is right on top. Security by design, cloud-centric operating model, AI driven personalization, technology innovation and so on. Um, and, and when I sort of zoom out of all of these and say, okay, so what's happening here for the CIO slash CTO, it's this whole notion of balancing demands for transformational returns on technology investments versus just saying, hey, you got to keep the business running in this new model, in this remote working model, with all of our employees sitting in their homes, you have to have enough um, robustness in your infrastructure, in your operating environment to keep the business running seamlessly without a break. Um, uh, I'm curious, your thoughts, your reactions on this. This so resonates, right, with uh, what we said, even right from the first slide where we talked about digital transformation and the focus on security, this is a double click into that. You know, a lot of that digital transformation also is not just getting the data, but understanding the data and being able to act on it. At Natrio, yep. what we do is, you know, we absorb and, and collect all this, all this data from multiple sources to basically understand if something is up or down, but it needs to move beyond that. Sometimes these alerts don't make sense. Sometimes they're false uh, alarms, right? And so being able to analyze them and distill them so that we can separate the signal from the noise is mm -hmm. critical, right? In terms of driving better decision-making around act or not acting. And then the right. third thing is automating that. So there's if there's some obvious things that we should act on, then act on it and alert the right people or, or, you know, or turn off the alarm because this is a false alarm. So right. that ability to analyze data so that we can actually, it, it informs us on what we should be doing is critical. I'd say also here is that the stakeholders involved in this have broadened. In the past, data analytics used to be, you know, very limited set of people who would understand what to do with it or who need anything to do with it. it used to be mm -hmm. first the business people, stakeholders, and then now we're getting more into IT decisions that are, you know, becoming you know, as we drive towards automation, more and more um, important to get this level of insight. So right. I can definitely understand why that's number one. And security by design, for sure. Oh my gosh, as we mentioned, hacking, ransomware, this, know. you know, and it's not just about creating a hard shell, right? It's also by how you design it from a product perspective and the people perspective and the technology. So it's a holistic process and it's understanding how that is, is um, what we should be doing around that, keeping up with the changes and the ongoing um, evolution of the space because it moves so quickly is so critical. So totally resonates with us too. Well, I mean, I guess that the first three here are sort of very aligned to your company's business objectives, which is awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do want to take uh, the next couple of slides to drill down on something that is that I know is close to your heart. Um, and that's cloud strategy. Um, so let's talk a little bit about cloud strategy. Um, you know, the perspective that the CIO, CTO have 
Uh, again, very uh, interesting development. You know, 74% of business leaders are engaged in cloud strategy. It's not just an IT problem. It's not just a CIO's agenda item. Over 50% of executives saying, hey, cloud is a strategic platform for growth and innovation. It's not just a means of, you know, switching from CapEx to OpEx and reducing costs and doing uh, that kind of cost optimization. Um, and then probably in some ways, um, uh, arguably, understandably, you know, it's 50, over 50% saying, look, we haven't really sort of seen the huge value, the transformational value coming out of the cloud investments, right? Um, but I think that that's going to start changing because of all the business leaders now coming to the table and saying, hey, this is not just an IT thing. It's something that we want to use um, to drive towards our business uh, agenda. So, you know, if you see, um, we, we, we found this to be pretty fascinating. And if you look at this, who's leading cloud? The entire C-suite is on it, right? So it's not just the CEO, CIO, and CFO. You can actually see um, the, the roles for tax leaders, the COO, the chief revenue officer, and even the CHRO all sort of taking a hand in different aspects. And, you know, the three aspects that are highlighted here, company-wide strategy, defining the business outcomes, helping shape the investment decision and driving value realization, and then developing product services and other customer-facing capabilities. I think it's really interesting that this has become such a huge universal C-suite agenda um, topic, cloud strategy. Um, and, I, and I think that bodes well for companies that are trying to seek value out of their investments, right? I mean, um, if I was a CIO or CTO, um, I'd feel happy about the fact that, you know, my uh, peers are actually coming to the table and saying, hey, we're going to actually help drive the value. It's not just your problem anymore. Yeah, this is actually super welcome change, you know, um, from where it used to be before. It used to be such a technology driven uh, kind of uh, value proposition. Now, I think a lot of people are, are being able to see the value of cloud applications, for example, that they can use and uh, see the benefit from anywhere, anytime, right? Because especially with COVID, people are working from home. They need to be able to access their data anywhere and not, not be able to, not need to go to the office and, and uh, access these on-premises um, applications. So certainly I think there's, there's that uh, recognition, it appears, you know, in terms of using different applications that are now in the cloud. What I think is also interesting is how much, how many of these companies are involved in creating new business models that are in the cloud themselves. So are yep. they leveraging cloud technologies to launch new products and services? And that is really cool. And that's the gray line at the bottom, right? That's mm -hmm. fascinating. That's number, that number is, is, is really awesome to see. Um, and yep. it's really a sea change in the industry in the past, you know, given what we've seen in previous years. Yep, absolutely. Um, I, I, well, I know we have just about five minutes, but um, here are a couple of other things to highlight. You know, again, we talked about cybersecurity, AI, and the hybrid cloud with analytics sort of being in focus. So it's kind of the usual suspects in some ways. Um, you know, those are the capabilities that are uh, taking a lion's share of the spend. Um, and of course, at the bottom, you see what's at, where the efficiencies are coming from. So to me, that's there's a dual message in the bottom two or three that it, look, that's where commoditization is happening. That's where cost takeout is gonna happen. That's where there will be uh, more pricing pressure for companies that are providing just those type of services. So that's something to keep in mind as well. And then, you know, we, we, we saw the uh, metric around realizing value. Well, here's how they're actually measuring crowd value. And, you know, you pointed to the product innovation well, faster innovation and delivery of new digital products and services, that's top of mind for, for companies, um, along with the operation, operational resilience, safety and soundness. And then of course the top line impact, uh, particularly with the CFO's focus on that. Um, what's also interesting is this whole notion of ability to execute on strategy to uh, pivot the business. I think that's important. And interestingly, coming out of the pandemic, you can see cost savings and efficiencies it's actually not that important at this point. It's really all about how how I can bring new new products, new value to customers in a much more compelling and meaningful way. That's fantastic. Totally resonates with some of what we're experiencing and believe in as well. It's great. Awesome. Well, uh, I think the last message that I probably uh, 
conclude with is tech has a huge role to play in the future of work. And, you know, of course, you can see a whole list of uh, spend areas or um, priority areas um, ranging from AI and analytics to cloud-based uh, applications, platforms, IoT, collaboration, remote security, RPA, uh, blockchain, AR, VR, which is kind of a recent entrant, um, upskilling and learning management, and then finally, no-code, low-code um, development as well. Um, any concluding thoughts from your side? Makes a lot of sense. You know, as I mentioned earlier, the whole analytics element is certainly something that we're looking into and our customers are asking us more of. Cloud-based applications and platforms is certainly something we'll be moving into because, you know, our customers have a lot more cloud workloads they like to monitor and manage. And also in many cases, they now also want to consume services that are from the cloud. So we do have a, a cloud native edition of what we do. The mm -hmm. internet of things is truly something we're monitoring everywhere as well to some degree, all the different sensors uh, that are there and the collaboration software in terms of networking, the need for that persistent, reliable connectivity becomes even more important as we talk about network management and monitoring, right? As well as you know, being able to assess the quality of the application that's running through some of these, um, you know, as, as a collaboration software company, for example. So those are certainly different elements we're seeing uh, very much interest in, um, you know, the security products for sure. The ones that I think we see less interest in would be, or at least hearing less about, given everything else, would be blockchain. I think there's been right. a lot of interest in that, but um, in the past, but I think this past year, a lot of the, you know, we were seeing, we're hearing more about conversations around remote work and everything mm -hmm. that supports collaboration remotely, um, working and getting observability extensively across, you know, one's digital supply chain versus um, the sort of blockchain elements of things. Um, so yeah. I, I think that this whole list, that would be the one where um, I would say not hearing as much about from my end of things. That's fair. And maybe, so I would maybe just add and say that, look, um, there's a lot in the top five or six, which um, grabs the headlines or which shapes the headlines. Um, the, so so we hear, hear a lot more there and there's a lot of action there for sure. Uh, blockchain, after the initial hype, there's been a steady progression and there are companies that are moving forward, but maybe not getting the headlines as much as before. So. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not like it's off the radar. It is very yeah. much there and there are changes that are happening. There are developments that are taking place. Um, it's just that the other stuff, particularly in the post-pandemic economy, um, have grabbed the headlines in many ways. Yeah, so this is definitely very pertinent. And I, I would say top issues that we're, we're hearing technology leaders focus on. And it's, uh, it's awesome that you were able to share some of these insights with us. And you know, to take some of the anecdotal information um, that we've been sensing, you know, mm -hmm. out to some of this really data-driven perspective about what um, everyone's really thinking. Well, you know, uh, PwC, we love the data, so um, that's uh, it's it's part and parcel of what we do. Um, really happy to share some of these insights with you, and uh, thank you again for the invite. I, I, I love these conversations. So, um, and congratulations again on the event. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rumit. Take care.